Hey, YouTube, this is the United States of Anxiety. I'm the host, Kai Wright. And hey, I'm Kusha. I help produce the show. Okay, so Kusha, what is this segment we're about to play for folks about? Yeah, Kai, this is the last segment from our episode about Juneteenth, and it is about the food of Juneteenth. The food that you eat on Juneteenth. I really loved making this. Uh, it's a conversation with food writer Nicole Taylor. She's also the host of the podcast Hot Grease. Uh, and we talked about the culinary traditions, the food ways, the why we eat what we eat on Juneteenth. Yeah, Kai, I love the moment from this segment at the end where you make the connection between one of the foods and your grandmother's house. Hot links, hot links. I had no idea there was history to why I sat around eating hot links in my grandmother's backyard, but there it is. So listen through to the end for that. And um, what else do they need to know, Kusha? So if you celebrate Juneteenth, tell us in the comments how you celebrate, what foods do you eat? And of course, if you like this video, please do like and subscribe. All right. Take a listen. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright. This is a special national broadcast of the United States of Anxiety to celebrate Juneteenth. So thanks for hanging out with us on this holiday. And it's time to turn this party to the topic of food. So I want to know what you're eating at your own cookout. We've been taking your calls, but now let me invite you to chime in on Instagram. And I got to confess, I am a very late adopter to this particular social platform, but our producers thought this would be a fun way to get me started. So since you are probably already taking pictures of your beautiful Juneteenth spreads and probably posting them in your stories, we'd love to make sure we see them too. You can tag me at Kai underscore right. So that's K-A-I underscore right like the brothers. Or you can just use the hashtag US of anxiety. And if you don't have Instagram, that's okay too. Just email us. Tell us what you've got cooking and why you eat it on Juneteenth. Bonus points if you include a photo or a voice note explaining it. But either way, just send it to us at anxiety at WNYC.org. That's anxiety at WNYC.org. So that's two ways you can keep talking to us while we enter this next phase of our conversation. And I am so excited to welcome someone who knows all about what you can eat on Juneteenth and how to cook those foods. Nicole Taylor is a food writer who has written extensively about the culinary traditions of the South, and she has just published, believe it or not, the first cookbook focused on the food of Juneteenth. It's titled Watermelon and Redbirds. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Thanks for having me. So let's start with a little bit of conversation about your own Juneteenth. When did you first start celebrating? Do you remember your first time out? I do. My first Juneteenth celebration was not in Texas. It was in a pocket park in the middle of Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Wow. I know people are like, what? But yes, probably more than a decade ago, I attended a community-based organization's annual Juneteenth festival in Brooklyn. And I, I will tell you something very special about that day. There was a black man dressed in cowboy attire with a pony and <laughs> Kids were on that pony, and I remember seeing uh, a, a little boy so happy, so joyful, mm. so innocent, trotting around the park. And it was that moment that I said, you know, Juneteenth is for me. It's for everyone. Because of the joy. You were like, I am going to claim totally. this joy. Totally. 100%. Wow. You know, I, I love hosting anything at my own home. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I grew up in a house, uh, in my grandmother's house where it was always everybody, it was the town square, you know, she loved to host. And I, I just wonder that for you, does, is hosting something you learned to do? Is it something like, what's your relationship to hosting people in general, but specifically for Juneteenth? Well, I'm definitely your grandma's play cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Because my house is always the town square. And I learned from watching elders in my family. You know, if it was the summertime and it was a 4th of July celebration, it was all day. Um, the kids had enough to eat. There was plenty of food. Everyone was invited. And everyone felt like something in 
or on the table was special for them or mm. made just for them. And I picked up on those clues and I look at my own celebrations and <laughs> I see those people there. I see elements of how they hosted and entertained people in, in, in me. Yeah, that's wonderful. Let's go back to the first Juneteenth celebration, 1866. What would have been eaten then? What would they what would they have been greasing on? For sure, you you find chunks and slices of watermelon. A lot of articles in Texas newspapers and magazines describe uh, free black people's celebration um, in 1866. And they write a ton about seeing watermelons and barbecues. Uh, those are the two things that you see time and time again that many scholars and food historians, listen, I'm not a scholar or food historian, I'm a master home cook, but I've definitely read a million times that you see what they call um, barbecue or cookouts where the whole animal is being done or it's mm -hmm. in the ground. So in Texas, you would see a lamb. It's, it wasn't uncommon for someone to roast or barbecue an entire lamb. Uh, obviously, brisket. Um, you would see that in, in Texas, traditional Texas Juneteenth celebration and sausages as well. Mm -hmm. So those two things for certain... I can't forget the red drink. Well, tell, let's talk about the red drink. So first <laughs> off, you know, um, anybody familiar with any kind of black cookout is familiar with red drink um, of all sorts. Um, but bring people in on what you're talking about and, like, why that's important to Juneteenth in particular. I did not understand or know the connection of Big Red Soda, which is a regional soft drink that you find mostly in Texas. I did not understand the connection of Hawaiian Punch, the connection of Besop, which is the national drink of Senegal, or Sorrel, what my Caribbean brothers and sisters call it, which is Besop and Sorrel are both hibiscus steeped in water, little sugar added, and spices. You find that same drink in Brazil. You find that same drink, that same steep flower drink in North Africa. It is a connection of Black people across the world, the red drink. And what I like to say is through the transatlantic slave trade, that drinking ritual, that color, that red ruby drink came with us. It came with us to the Americas. And you see in old plantation cookbooks where writers say that enslaved people had cherry liqueurs or strawberry shrubs. And during their celebrations, there would be big batches of strawberry lemonade. So for generations, Black people, and particularly in America, have gathered around a punch bowl <laughs> uh, um, with the color red uh, spewing out for sure. So that's our connection. It's, it's everywhere. And some scholars and stuff say that the color red is connected to African spirituality, mm. to royalty, and crazily, I mean, when I put on le red lipstick, I feel powerful. It is a, it is a color that is alive and vibrant uh, and says, I'm here. But it's not known. There's theories, but it's not known exactly why red, um, why red drinks. It's the, what we, what we have theories about it. Yeah. There are a lot of theories about why I, I definitely think the dots where I know the dots have been, um, traced back to, um, Africa, to the continent of Africa and the, the drinking ritual and tradition. Mm -hmm. So, Many believe that we brought that with us. Mm. I know we brought it with us. I mean, why would it still be here? Why would it still be here? Why would it still be here? We, I, you know, I was surprised to learn that this was the first cookbook focused on Juneteenth. I don't know why I'm surprised to learn that, but when, when did you realize that? <laughs> when the publisher said it. <laughs> I, had no clue. I had no clue. I mean, I've been working on this proposal since 2018, and that was the farthest thing from my mind. Mm. Um it took me a while to say it out loud. That that's a lot of pressure, and it's also kind of like, why? <laughs> yeah. I was asking, kind of like, really? This is the first book. 
um, I'm proud to be a pioneer, and I'm also excited about the other cookbooks that are going to come after me. I want to make sure that people know that this cookbook, 75 recipes and the stories are about my Juneteenth and that there's more than one way to Juneteenth um, and that Juneteenth is a holiday that's all over America because of the Great Migration. And even if you're not from Texas, we're all bonded. We are all connected. We all want freedom. We are um, our parents, our grandparents had the same dream for us. And that is for us to live and thrive in America. Um, And so that's what connects us. And so, yeah, get into it. Juneteenth people. Indeed. I mean, thinking about the foodways part of it as, as the holiday has spread through the great migration to other parts of the country, um, have, have the foods changed in any way? Have you noticed that? Has there been any sort of thing that's been added once it showed up in Milwaukee or Oakland, you know, I will say one of the things that I noticed is hot links and sausages. They are a tradition in Texas Juneteenth celebration. Like someone could do an entire book about Juneteenth sausages. (laughs) Why is that? (laughs) Well, I mean, if you go to East Texas, there's a certain way uh, and a certain type of sausages being made or hot guts is another word that people will use in Texas. It is different from what you find in, in another part of the state. So yeah, hot links and sausages are a thing. I grew up with hot links or red links in Georgia and I was born and raised in Athens, Georgia, which is a city about 60 miles outside of Atlanta. It's Northeast Georgia. And there's a brand called McEvers and they're really red, and the red comes from Red 40. Uh, Those are the red hot links that I grew up on. Mm. And I feel like I've talked to so many Black people who live in Chicago or D.C. They have a very special sausage brand that they love, and they remember folks putting them on the grill um, during Black celebrations. So what I've noticed is that the hot link thing I wouldn't say it disappeared, but I think it has evolved and people have had to adapt because they don't live in Texas anymore. You know Um, what? I have never until this moment thought really given thought to the fact that we ate these red hot links in my again at my grandmother's house. I, that was a standard part of any cookout were these red hot links. We don't have any Texas people. We're our, our, our path goes back to Alabama, um, and this was in Indiana. But I never until this moment thought about that. They were red hot links, and they were a staple. Yeah, and so I, I talk about in one of the, the sidebars in the book, like how do people, how did you have them? People like them with mustard sometimes. Um, and mustard. Just on like People like them with the, you know, what I call loaf loaf of bread or loaf bread or uh-huh. really cheap white bread. Um, and sometimes people just like them on the side as almost a condiment to the entire plate at Juneteenth or other Black celebrations. But yeah, they're, they're our staple for Black cele- summertime Black celebrations. Yeah, for sure. I, it, I'm, it's kind of throwing me. I, the things we do and don't <laughs> even think about, I just, and I never even thought about it. That's really great. Well, so the 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 book is called, as we said, watermelon and red birds. Why? What are, what are the, each of those things represent? So you said watermelon was would have been a big part of the eighteen sixty six celebration. Um, uh, why is that? And and what is it about red birds? Yeah, I came to this title at various <laughs> at two different moments. First, I knew that I wanted to bring in a very classic all-American summertime fruit or vegetable in the title. So I landed on on watermelon, and watermelon is a fruit that is indigenous to the African continent. Um, But it's also a fruit that all Americans love to snack on. Um, So I thought it would be very fitting to have watermelon in the title. And red birds, wow. When I was growing up, my mom used to tell me Look out the window, look out the window. There's a red bird. A red bird is outside. There's someone from our family that's coming back to say hello. Mm. Blow them a kiss. Mm. And I would blow them a kiss. And she was like, that bird is a symbol of good luck. 
And I, I kind of forgot about that story. And one day I was sitting on the subway, New York City subway. And that story literally just, just dropped out the sky. And I'm like, Redbirds, that story, that story is symbolic of the past, the present, and the future. And that's just, that's such a great origin story. So right now, a lot of people are maybe wrapping up their Juneteenth celebration. Some of y'all are probably just getting started, um, you know, but uh, for those that, that are wrapping up or that are, uh, you know, when they wrap up later, what's, what's the perfect way uh, to end a day of a Juneteenth celebration, Nicole? Oh, wow. Well, I always say this. I'm going to start with the perfect way to start, and then I'll go to the end. Okay. I like to make sure that you center the origin story of Juneteenth at the very beginning of your celebration. So for all the folks who are listening and they haven't done this, stop the music, uh, stop what you're doing, and raise a glass. Like, raise a glass to Texans raise a glass for our ancestors. Uh, and I like to put the red cups down then. And the red and blue cups, I put them away, I think, starting with the reverence, with beautiful glassware and saying a, for me, it's a prayer. Uh, it could be a toast. But I think it's important to center the holiday when you begin your celebration. But at the end, love y'all, let's talk about the end. Oh, boy. At the end, right before, you know, before I let go, the song comes on. You, you have to like have pouring people more red drink. That's when you start getting the shots of brown liquor out. And when I say brown liquor, I mean <laughs> whiskey, American whiskey. Uh, and then that's when people want a little extra food. And that's when I start thinking about like, oh, maybe I'll make people tostadas now. Like I have like two pieces of ribeye that I've wrapped up and snuck away. But let me let me make a few tostadas. And I, I talk about that in the cookbook, how it's late and people are still around. So I'm, I'm figuring out more food. Uh, a midnight snack, just that final libation. Yes. And uh, looking at the playlist and figuring out what wasn't played. <laughs> that is a way to end at Juneteenth. That is the way that I need to end my <laughs> Juneteenth instead of working. I need to go get into this brown liquor. I love it. We're going to leave it there. But listeners, do keep those Instagram tags and emails coming. We know a lot of y'all are already taking pictures of your Juneteenth spread, so show them to us as well. You can tag me at Kai underscore right. So that's K-A-I underscore right, like the brothers. Or just add the hashtag US of anxiety. And if you don't have Instagram, you can just email us. Tell us what you've got cooking and why you eat it on Juneteenth. Bonus points if you include a photo or a voice note explaining it. Either way, just send it to anxiety at WNYC.org. That's anxiety at WNYC.org. And if you want to try out some of the recipes in Nicole Taylor's book, you're going to have to go get it. Watermelon and Red Birds. You don't have to cook those recipes only Joe on Juneteenth, by the way. They are meant for celebration. Nicole, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for having me on. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. And thanks to everybody around the country for joining our Juneteenth special. A particular thanks to our partner stations in Texas, Houston Public Media, KERA Dallas, and Texas Public Radio, you're awesome. United States of Anxiety is a production of WNYC Studios. Our team includes Emily Botin, Regina Dahir, Karen Froman, Kusha Navadar, Rahima Nasa, and Jared Paul. Engineering by Milton Ruiz tonight. Our theme music was written by Hannes Brown and performed by the Outer Borough Brass Band. And I am Kai Wright. Thanks for spending time with us tonight, and happy Juneteenth. <laughs>